So without any further ado, to talk about upgrades at the Scott Trade Center, let me introduce Mr. Chris Zimmerman, President and CEO of the St. Louis Blues. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you. So, uh, wow, following uh, the owner of the War Golden State Warriors and the fantastic project they're working on, which is creating uh, not just a new billion-dollar arena, but really having a major impact on a broader area of the city, um, which is really <clears throat> so much of what's happening around North America, around these facilities. So Patrick asked me to um, come up w and talk a little bit about our project. A few of you may have um, heard a little bit of the background. Um, the quick uh, introduction to where we stand here in St. Louis uh, with our arena. It opened in 1994. We have over the 23 years that we've been open, uh, we've hosted more than 35 million people. We are a building that is a bit unusual. Um, what what the Warriors are, is doing is really unusual in that they are completely privately financing the project, which I would say is uh, more the ex uh, an exception than the rule. Overall, if you go back to the big building boom in sports facilities throughout the 90s and, and then the following decade, on average, uh, these buildings, for simplicity, let's say 50% of the funding is public and 50% of it is typically comes from private funds. For us, the, really the entire premise for what we've been working on, uh, or the core premise, maybe not entire, but the core premise is really this. We are a multi-purpose building. Uh, the blues that organization that operates the building, we represent about 40% of the events. And what we have to do in the rest of it, whether it's our concert business, and then particularly in the sports front, working with the St. Louis Sports Commission on events like NCAA basketball championships, the Frozen Four, U.S. figure skating championships, the World Junior Championships of Ice Hockey, which is a major 10-day event that um, we bid on. We were runner-up, and we hope to bring here uh, certainly one of the next times that that event comes to the U.S. When we started the project, actually, when I arrived here in St. Louis, uh, I started with the Blues in June of 2014, so I'm just about to start my fourth season when I got here, a couple weeks after I got here, I got told the backstory. We had hosted the NCAA uh, basketball tournament in March, and John Calipari, coach at the University of Kentucky, I think he's still coach there now this week, right? Um, we'll, 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 we'll see, but he had some pretty high standards, or high, higher standards than we, we were delivering on. We had no Wi-Fi in the building. There were not coaches' offices. He was I, actually, I was told, in the shower trying to figure out how to make a call out. And after speaking with the rest of the SEC, who we were scheduled to host their basketball tournament this March, a list of expectations for the building to stay competitive and hold on to this event was created. And from there, we started to build out and understand what it would take to really refresh and create renewal around our building. And so with that, I think we'll, the next thing we'll do, I'll, I'll play a video. It's longer than my usual rule that every video should be no more than about 90 seconds. But it re I think you'll see, it really talks about the building, where we start it, and what we want it to become. 
For over eight decades, 14th and Clark has been the epicenter of sports and entertainment in our city. A place for our community, our city, and our region to come together. A place to laugh, a place to compete, a place to dance, to cheer, and to celebrate. And for almost a quarter century, 14th and Clark has been the home of the St. Louis Blues. Born from civic pride, the team has been beloved by its fans and a pillar of the community for over 50 years. The Blues created an instant energy and a love affair with the city the moment they arrived. And that energy carries forward to this day. The Blues came to 14th and Clark from their former home on Oakland Avenue. Playing in the new Keel Center, the building brought a new level of energy and business development to the downtown area. Once again, 14th and Clark became the home for great professional, collegiate, and amateur sports. Far more than a sports facility, the arena served as a magnet for the best concerts, entertainment, and family shows touring the world. From the original Keel Center to the current Scott Trade Center, 14th and Clark has brought the world to St. Louis. Hosting NCAA wrestling and basketball, championship figure skating, and the Frozen Four National Championships. Within its walls, fans have witnessed some of the best characters in hockey history, Hall of Fame players, and legends of the game. It has hosted concerts and events that appeal to people from all backgrounds and cultures. And when the Pope came to St. Louis, this is where we hosted him. It has remained the unofficial town hall of St. Louis, and it has brought millions of people to our downtown. And now, with that same sense of community pride and dedication, it is time for a new generation of commitment to St. Louis. It is time for a renewed sense of commitment to showcasing our city, our state, and our region. By strengthening our relationships and partnering with those that want to shape a brighter future, we believe the time is now to move St. Louis forward. After 23 years and 35 million guests, it is time to begin again. Our goal is to renew and to create a new fan-friendly arena, one with updated infrastructure, improved fan amenities, and technology that responds to the needs of today's guests. As we revitalize our regional entertainment hub, we will showcase more St. Louis character in our food, beverage, and hospitality offerings. We will upgrade our amenities in order to bring more energy and excitement to our game and event presentation. We will offer new seating options. We will create new gathering spaces, better building accessibility, and fan experience that will continue to attract the nation's and the world's greatest events. We will remind our community of the pride, dedication, and love that they have for St. Louis. We will showcase who we are and what we can be. And we will continue to bring people to our city so they can laugh, compete, dance, cheer, and celebrate. Right here at the Town Hall of St. Louis. Right here at 14th and Clark. Okay. And Dylan, if you could put it back to the, there we go. So Chris, first of all, uh, this process has been arduous, to say the least. Some folks here are, uh, especially the students, many students are not from the St. Louis area. So maybe talk a little bit about the process up to this point. Sure. So uh, I think... You know, every one of these projects is, is, I think, hard in their own way, um, even, even when you're the Golden State Warriors. Um, so we, um, you know, we started working on this back in 2014. And uh, soon after that, the whole Rams situation 
moved into its its you know full force, and uh, you know I think that certainly is an element that is always in the backdrop here. That we as a city, um, I don't know. I think that's probably one of the worst divorces in the history of pro sports. And I think that it's inevitable that that's a little bit always in the backdrop when we're in various conversations. And um, so maybe that's one of our unique elements here. You know, the, the building was uh, the ownership group that opened this building was essentially connected to civic progress, which for those of you who don't know what that is, it's, it's, a, it's an organization of a number of the leading business companies um, in the city. And they had taken over the team really to make sure that we kept NHL hockey here in St. Louis because the business was a challenge. The city was losing money operating what at the time was the Keel Auditorium, the old arena which people um, to this day have great heart for, um, was certainly past its time. And so the owners at the time of the Blues, which was essentially a, a subsection of civic progress, funded the building. So there's never been meaningful public participation in our building, which is different, obviously, from the Dome, even different from Bush 2. And so we've, we've, we, all of our discussions start with all of that backdrop. And, and what, we, what we've done and what we've demonstrated to people is that for us, this is about how we stay competitive and how we keep driving really valuable um, uh, sports tourism to the region. So we saw some of the renovations there. Obviously, the scoreboard, uh, Jumbotron, you know, Chris had a great quote in the Post-Dispatch where the previous Jumbotron at Scott Trade was the smallest or second smallest in the Second league. smallest. So you called it the, uh, nickname, the mini tr- Nickname the Minitron. The Minitron. And, and uh, so, yes, actually, can, can we go to that next slide that was, um, sure, that I on. had? Yeah. So, um, actually, I think somebody, the day that it went up, put, they actually had, uh, so obviously on the left is our old board, and on the right is the new one. Um, somebody had tweeted that actually stacked on top of each other, which is even more dramatic. But um, yeah, I've heard different numbers that we went from second smallest to eighth largest. Uh, we certainly, being the largest was not a goal, um, but we knew that this would obviously be, um, it's a powerful, dramatic part of the game presentation. And um, yeah, the response has been great. And how about the premium seating area? That was one of the things that we got to see during the tour, and it really was magnificent. Yeah, you know, we have a three-year plan. This summer, this past summer, um, we did approximately thirty-four million dollars worth of renovations, and we touched a lot of the areas that specifically the SEC had said. If we're going to keep the tournament there, you're going to need to do this. So that had to do with addressing locker rooms. Um, we redid every restroom in the building. Um, we've started to um, actually last summer we did some of the uh, concession stands. We put in the HD control room. So there's there's a broad list of elements which actually, quite honestly, are meant first and foremost. Um, obviously to provide fan amenities, but without question to address a key partner's expectations. You mentioned um, we created a new hospitality area, um, which are our theater boxes. Um, similar to lots of other arenas, 
that are taking spaces and rather than selling 16 seat suites, we're giving fans an area for that, the suite premium experience, but you can do it only owning four seats. And in today's world, the small and medium sized companies are the ones that that's a product that really works. And so um, we're thrilled. We think we did that a little differently than other buildings and, um, and we're sold out. So I'm happy that worked well, except I've told the ticketing guys, obviously we didn't price it high enough. So <laughs> always a challenge. Yeah. What's, on tap for next year. And, and, and everyone needs to understand, obviously this facility is being used throughout the year. So one of the challenges that the Blues face is you only have 10 weeks yes. to cram in a significant amount of renovation. So what's on tap for the summer of 2018? Well, some of that is um, will still depend on um, a couple of other issues that are Small swirling issues. around me each day. Um, well, sh- share some of those yeah, issues. Yeah, so we... we, we um, Back in February, after you know significant time working with city officials, working with the Board of Aldermen, um, in early February we were a financing agreement and legislation and an ordinance was approved, um, which um, essentially would have authorized the issuing of bonds that the proceeds would have been approximately $65 million. Um, and that was being funded by the city. That was approved by the Board of Aldermen. It was approved prior to the Board of Aldermen by the Ways and Means Committee. Then we went on to have uh, the Board of Estimate and Apportionment approve it. One dissenting vote. That was the city comptroller. Um, And then the mayor signed it in February. We had all the plans, all the work that goes into launching these bonds was done with an expectation that they'd be sold in July. Um, The city comptroller has taken a position for some time now um, that she wasn't going to sign the bill. If you think about that, that essentially says, although all these other bodies have approved it and voted on it, you withholding your signature essentially would mean that she would have veto power over anything that these other groups are approving. Is there any legislation or documentation that would allow her that veto power, to your knowledge? Um, uh, No, there's not. I mean, she certainly, uh, her job is to protect the city's credit, Mm -hmm. and that's her position, that we are putting, that specifically this program puts the city's uh, credit rating at risk. Um, and the city's credit rating has been downgraded over the last few years. So I don't dismiss that as a meaningful issue. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. However, there are multiple ways um, to get to the right end point. Unfortunately, her refusal ultimately, um, you know, we had actually have had to bring action along with the city um, against her. And so that's one uh piece of legal that is um, time-consuming. I mean, did you foresee this happening? You couldn't um, have. Well, certainly not back in February. (laughs) Um, You know, one of the things that is really most disappointing about this is um, we knew that February approval was really critical because the NCAA was watching what was going on, as was the SEC, and they, in April, were going to award events for the years 2019 through 2022. And so it's quite clear that we would not have been awarded any events without some level of clarity that we were moving forward. We decided also that we would take out a bridge loan so that we wouldn't have to wait for the bonds so that we could be get this work done for this season and the SEC. So, um, was it? Could we have seen this coming? Well, certainly, as I went as we went through the spring and summer, it, we could see the challenge. Um, uh, but it's just it's a cha- it's a difficult place to be. Any questions for Chris? Any of you that are interested in the Scott Trade Center in Blues hockey? Questions from the audience. 
right here. Um, the scoreboard itself isn't. Um, some of our plans um, are to do. We have we have some roof work in our in our three year plan, um, but um, no, the board it, itself isn't. Um, you know, we're, one of the things we've done in addition to locker rooms, we, I think we've taken greater care around how we treat our entertainers as well um, in some of you know, the green rooms and hospitality. So that's an important part as well. Question in the back I saw, or first here and then there. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so... Right. Yeah. So I'm sure I'll give you several um, examples. So uh, um, in Detroit, they they have just opened um, a new arena, um, and there will be also development around the arena. But the arena, the cost was approximately 450 million, and um, the state of Michigan um, provided 250 million dollars for that facility. The, we could give you a, a, a long list, and you would see that it would average around 50-50. Um, if anything, a little bit, it, would, it might even skew a little bit higher to the public side. And, and those, those, those numbers are out there. Um, I'll get an example in Nashville, um, where they have um, a joint city-county government, um, the building um, was funded uh, primarily uh, by the public dollars, uh, and all of the ongoing uh, improvements are all being funded by public dollars. And to, to your question again, I mean, in San Francisco, it's an interesting case study. So you have AT&T, Ballpark, uh, the Chase Center, private money. Then you go to Sacramento, their award-winning Sports Business Journal's 2016 Facility of the Year, uh, Golden One Center, and that was about 50-50 uh, public-private. If you go back to when the latest stadium craze began with Jacobs Field, Camden Yards in Baltimore and Cleveland, respectively, from the late 80s, really in through the early 2000s, if you go to, in fact, we have a young man here today from Marquette University. If you Google Sports Facility Reports, which is at Marquette University's website, Sports Facility Reports. It gives you the breakdown of every single sports facility that's been built, the percentage of public and private money. When I've gone through that before with my students, uh, again, especially that, that those buildings built between the late 80s and the early 2000s, about 60, 65% of the money mm -hmm. financing facilities is coming from the public sector. I think there's more scrutiny, uh, obviously, going forward as more research is done. But, but again, in this particular case, you have to put things in perspective. And the amount of money that we're talking about here, uh, as much the same case with the Major League Soccer bid here in St. Louis, the amount of money that this community was seeking from the public sector, much less than what you've seen in other communities. But as Chris mentioned earlier, there is this black eye that we're feeling right now as a community because of what happened with the ramps. Uh, other questions for Chris? I see one back here and then one here. Um, I don't think that will go up for a vote. There, there, are, there, there really are many, many flaws in that proposal. Um, it's essentially saying we're going to take more money from, from the team, and although we've approved something, here, you go pay for it. So it essentially um, negates any of the <clears throat> agreements that are in place, but it, there are also elements of that that are, are simply illegal. So that I do not see that that having being viable. Two more questions for Chris, right here. So um, I guess part of the thinking around this must must 
touch on the fact that in the last 10 years we've seen discussion around stadium welfare in that um, cities are pouring money into stadiums or into sports complexes where they don't necessarily see that value in turn to the city. I'm sure that's part of it. But then is the separation of the city and the county governance here in St. Louis playing into that on the other level as well? Um, so if you go back and, and you look at um, uh, certainly the dome, where you have funding actually um, from three sources, city, county, and state. Um, Bush Stadium, Bush 2 also um, has different levels of public support, um, but at a much smaller number. Um, again, sort of each one is different based on, on the time when the discussion happens and who wants to step forward. But um, if the fun, your fundamental question is, is the city and county issue for our city uh, hindering some of our ability to get to better solutions? The answer is yes. And, and I would certainly tell you um, over the long term, I hope we can help be a force to address that because we as a community are losing out to Louisville, Nashville, Indianapolis. We just we are fragmenting our ability to compete, and and, and I I just don't believe that's good for St. Louis over the long term. I'd like to take one more question. Yes. really doesn't. Um, you know, we're, we're doing the things that we believe um, are good um, for us to stay competitive, for us to make it a better experience for a wide um, group of fans and guests. Um, and, and we're doing things that obviously over time we hope help, help our business as well and our business improving and driving more revenue our city wins as well. And, and so it's those um, objectives that the project, that drives the project. From Nike to Easton Hockey, the Los Angeles Kings, Vancouver Canucks, and now here with the St. Louis Blues. He's been a great resource for this community. Let's give a hand to Blues President and CEO, Chris Zimmerman. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Patrick. Let's do a quick photo over here.